Welcome, all of you, to the Institute for Policy Studies. I'm John Cavana, and I'm the IPS director. And today we'll be discussing Cuba and U.S.-Cuba relations with Saul Landau. And Saul has been a fellow at the Institute for Policy Studies for 40 years, during which time he has made uh, dozens of award-winning films. He's written books. He's written articles. And vis-a-vis -vis the subject of today's session, Cuba, uh, Saul has been going back and forth to Cuba for over half a century. My first trip to Cuba began in May of 1960, when I was a graduate student at the University of Wisconsin. And uh, from reading about what was going on in Cuba, I had an overwhelming curiosity to see what was actually happening in Cuba. Because I said to myself, how long can the Cubans get away with this before the United States invades Cuba? Um, so, I mean, later on there was an interpretation that the United States was afraid of the Cuban model of socialism. Well, that's not what I observed. My observation was that the Cuban, that the United States government was deeply annoyed at Cuban disobedience, which was another model that, is, that Cuba set up for the rest of Latin America. And I might add that, you know, if you look today at Latin America and you compare it to Latin America 1959, you can see a significant change. You can say that Hugo Chavez has led a move to take Latin America away from the United States, and he has done it successfully. If you count the Chavistas or Fidelistas who are now running governments in Latin America, you start with uh, El Salvador, Nicaragua, Venezuela, Bolivia, Ecuador, Argentina, Brazil, Uruguay, maybe Peru. Anyway, and several of the Caribbean countries. Look at the Republica Dominicana and some of the English-speaking islands, which are today quite uh, a bit more independent than they were back 50 plus years ago. Now these are fidelistas, these heads of state, although they were all elected and didn't take power through revolution as the Cuban leadership did. So if you look back, Fidel Castro has been very successful in, if you like, carrying out what Chavez calls the Bolivarian ideal, right? Independence for Latin America. But back in May of 1960, I remember taking, there was a flight every hour from Miami to Havana, either on Pan Am or on Cubana. And I came down in a mostly empty flight, no tourists. I didn't meet one tourist. Um, tourism had literally shut down. And the large owners, that is the really wealthy people, had already gone to Florida. And now by the spring of 1960, the middle class was starting to flee Cuba as well, thinking that their property would be seized, and they were correct, uh, that they, there were no more business for their stores, especially if the stores depended on tourism, as many businesses did in Havana. So you had a daily flight of people leaving Cuba, um, and the Cuban government was moving on a daily basis to the left. But the initial response of the U.S. government to the Cuban Revolution was, hey, be obedient. And the initial antithesis or antipathy toward the Cuban Revolution began before the revolutionaries took power. In the United States or officials of the U.S. Embassy in Havana had participated in organizing a coup d'etat after they had determined that Batista had no longer any possibility of retaining power. This was in the fall of 1958. And they tried to organize a coup of colonels in the armed forces to take power so as to prevent the revolutionaries from seizing power. However, luckily the colonels argued amongst themselves and it didn't happen. So as soon as the revolutionaries took power and declared that Cuba is now finally independent and free, Washington said, hey guys, 
just be obedient and everything will be okay. And the Cuban government said, we're independent, not obedient. And to my mind, this is the cardinal sin that the Cuban revolution and the Cuban government committed against the United States, the sin of disobedience. Up until now, the United States controlled the vote in the OAS, controlled Latin America's vote in the United Nations, and by and large controlled the behavior of Latin American companies, especially vis-a-vis -vis private property and U.S. property. Those people who had been disobedient were punished. The most recent example had been Jacobo Arbenz in Guatemala, who seized uh, property belonging to United Fruit Company, which refused to pay its fair share of the taxes. Arbenz was punished by having the CIA organize uh, an insurrection to uh, essentially take over the country. It was a coup, and it was organized in Washington. And this was a punishment for the sin of disobedience. And other governments before this had fallen as well. Usually it was easy to just knock off the head of state in one way or another. It's happened in Nicaragua on several occasions and in various countries throughout Latin America. The Cuban Revolution was the first essentially confrontation with the United States that said, we are independent and we're not going to listen to your orders and we're not going to be obedient. We'll do what we think is best, not what you think is best. And that was the sin. And that sin has been committed now for 54 years. And there's no sign of it going away. And U.S.-Cuban relations have been bad or broken for now 50 plus years. Uh, I was in Cuba on the day that President Eisenhower announced that the United States was breaking relations. That was in January, early January of 1961. And the people from the U.S. Embassy were all leaving. And I remember listening to Fidel's speech. He says, because there had come when um, the U.S. Embassy was literally a nest of spies. I mean, mo there was no commerce going on between Cuba and the United States. There was no agriculture, yet there was a whole bunch of positions, you know, um, council, agricultural counselor, business counselor. There's no business and no agriculture going on. So Fidel asked in his speech, so what are these guys doing if there's none? He says, you know darn well what they're doing. And the crowd shouts, they're the CIA. And that, essentially they were correct. And so Fidel says, from now on, we have 13 members of the diplomatic our diplomatic mission in Washington. There will from now on be 13 members of the U.S. mission in Havana. And then he added, y si todos quieren irse, que se vayan. And if all of them want to leave, let them go. Eisenhower said, this is the last straw, and he broke relations. However, in March of 1960, the righteous Eisenhower had ordered the CIA to foment a plan to overthrow the Cuban government. So this was now January 61. So 10 months before, Eisenhower had already ordered a subversion plan for Cuba. And one that everybody knew about because Miami was not a great place to keep secrets. And the CIA had recruited several thousand Cuban men and brought them to Guatemala to receive military training so that they would invade the island of Cuba and take over the government. In April of 1961, as most of you know, or some, a few of us actually remember, this invasion took place at a spot that the Americans call the Bay of Pigs. Cuba calls it Playa Hiron. Hiron Beach was one of the landing spots where the invaders alit from their U.S. boats. Some 1,500 Cuban exile men came, came ashore, and the fight was on. Um, Fidel and the revolutionary forces knocked them off in 72 hours. This became known in Washington as the Bay of Pigs fiasco. And President Kennedy, of course, got egg all over his face because Eisenhower had handed the plan over to him rather than carry it out himself. He must have had doubts. Eisenhower, being a, a very uh, experienced general, knew about the many, many mistakes that occur on the field of battle. And in the Bay of Pigs, 
many of these mistakes were made. Um, the plan was actually a fairly simple one. The invaders would land at this rather remote spot on the south coast of Cuba and make their way north for a few miles on the only highway that existed where there was a big sugar mill. If they could capture this sugar mill, they could control the heights and therefore control the highways coming in all directions and be in a position to set up the independent or free republic of Cuba, whatever they were going to call it. They would be quickly recognized by the U.S. government and then they would bid for U.S. military aid, which would of course be immediately forthcoming. That was the plan. Kennedy didn't want to have U.S. troops involved in the initial invasion because he thought it would ruin his reputation throughout the world, which it probably would have. I mean, another big bully attacking a, a, a small island nation. Anyway, I think the revolutionaries saw through the plan quickly. The Americans sent planes to bomb to take out the Cuban Air Force two days before the landing, which alerted the Cubans that it was about to happen. Had they done it like the day before or the same day, that wouldn't have had, it wouldn't have had the effect of that alarm clock. Anyway, they didn't take out all of the Cuban planes. They were somewhat successful, but not altogether. And the Cuban Air Force then took out the supply boats waiting in the harbor so that the invaders could not be supplied or resupplied. And that left only American naval ships out in the uh, international waters off the Cuban coast waiting to be called by Kennedy, which he never did. After the successful defeat of the invasion, um, Cuba was now a socialist, formerly socialist republic. Up until now, they had been going socialist, but the formal announcement came just before the Bay of Pigs. And Fidel also announced that he was a Marxist-Leninist, and that that was the ideology now of the revolution. But the Soviet Union had just really begun to get involved with Cuba. They didn't even have relations with Cuba until 1960. Um, and the United States then changed the disobedience model into the Cold War pattern. And it was now a fight for freedom against the evil Soviet empire. So that came post Bay of Pigs, really. And after the humiliating defeat, Fidel told me in one interview that he thought he made a tact, a, an era of tact when he presented the prisoners on television, which was humiliating to President Kennedy. He said, one has to be graceful and modest in victory. He says, and I should have known that, but I guess I was too young. And uh, Kennedy, of course, took this as a major affront, that not only had he lost, but Castro was throwing it in his face. And Kennedy set out to get revenge and uh, generated a very heightened, I think the only way to put it is a war of terror against Cuba. The CIA, using Cuban exiles and CIA officials, launched attacks against the Cuban coast with speedboats using machine guns and cannons. They landed small parties to get into Cuba, infiltrate, to blow up factories, sugar mills, try to get the oil refinery, and kill Cuban militia people, and they even killed a te young teacher. So they were waging a war of terror, and it was a very hard war, by the way, to defend against. Uh, so Cuba's losses began to mount to the point, and, and I'll tell you a story that's been little written of, but it's true, in Cuban-U.S. relations. Fidel essentially decided that he couldn't uh, Cuba couldn't really continue to take these losses. And he dispatched a very loyal lieutenant named Ernesto Che Guevara to go to Uruguay at an OAS meeting to meet with Kennedy's representative, Richard Goodwin, and to offer him an Entente plan. Goodwin and Che Guevara met in secret for several hours in an apartment in Uruguay. And Goodwin has written a memo of this, and it's declassified, so anybody can look it up and see it. At the meeting, Che Guevara said, look, we are willing to negotiate a few things, one of which is we can loosen and weaken our military relations with the Soviet Union. 
two, we can stop essentially exporting revolution to the rest of Latin America. And three, we can work out a compensation plan, plan to uh, pay back the American companies which we've expropriated. And Goodwin said, those sound fine, what would you like in return? And Che said, basically a modus vivendi, that you stop attacking us, leave us alone. Well, Goodwin returned with this plan to Washington and reported to President Kennedy. And Kennedy said, uh, so Goodwin, what do you think? Well, actually, Che had given Goodwin a box of uh, cigars, which were Kennedy's favorites, Upman number one. And uh, Kennedy had lit one up and said, you know, Goodwin, actually, you should have smoked the first one. As there was a, one of the plans to kill Castro had been poison cigar. <laughs> anyway, he said, so Goodwin, what do you think? And Goodwin says, well, I think their offer shows weakness. I think we should turn up the heat. Um, those were Goodwin's words. And Kennedy agreed with his advisor. And instead of coming to terms with Cuba, after Cuba had made an offer, they turned up the heat. And the war on terror, the war of terror escalated so that the attacks mounted. And shortly thereafter, in September, one month later, Fidel Castro gave the green light to the Soviet Union to place nuclear missiles on the island as the only way to defend the island against what he thought was an almost certain US invasion. These included tactical nuclear missiles. Tactical meaning that they would be useful only if the United States invaded. They would be used against U.S. troops coming onto the island. But they had also other missiles, and the Soviets placed medium-range bombers in Cuba that were capable of carrying nuclear payloads into the United States. And some of the missiles could have reached Washington, D.C., or, you know, large cities in Texas. So th this was for the first time the United States was facing what it had forced the Soviet Union to face, which was missiles close to its own border that were capable of hitting major cities inside the country. The United States had missiles all around the Soviet Union and would fly missile-heavy missile airplanes to the edge of Soviet airspace before they turned around regularly on a daily basis. Now the Soviets had the same against them, but Washington says, unacceptable. We can't allow that. Get those missiles out or else. Well, how many of you have read about or remember the missile crisis? It's the closest the world ever came to nuclear war, I think. Because the United States sent its Navy out into the Atlantic to stop future Soviet deliveries to Cuba. So the Soviet fleet was coming toward Cuba, and the US fleet was coming to meet the Soviet fleet in, in mid-Atlantic. In mid -Atlantic. And Kennedy sent a, a very stern message to Pr Prime Minister Khrushchev of the Soviet Union that this is it. Either you're going to withdraw these missiles or, or we're going to take them away from you in, in the ocean and then go get them in Cuba. There's no negotiating this. You've got to get them out of there. And I think the whole world sat on the edge of, this, of its seat. It's, it was scary to the nth degree. And I remember at the time, doing a radio show for Pacifica Radio with Paul Baran, who at that time was a professor at Stanford University. And Baran said to me in the, in the car driving to the radio station, he said, don't worry, the Soviet Union never fights for anybody else. They're not going to do it for Cuba either. Don't worry. And I said, well, I feel a little better now. He said, look back at history. They've never done it. They didn't stand up for their Greek comrades. They didn't stand up for the Yugoslavs. They didn't try to free their Iranian brothers and sisters. None of that. They never do. They only fight for their own. And of course, he was right. The Soviets did capitulate, and Kennedy made the necessary concessions so that Khrushchev would have a little covering, you know, to save a little face. And the missile crisis got resolved without nuclear war. But it's how a small nation that's being attacked by the United States viciously. And that was US policy. It was terror. There's no other word to describe it. When you send uh, 
armed boats with armed people to shoot and, and uh, shell and sabotage another people's territory. What else do you call that? Um, anyway, that was U.S. diplomacy. And I remember um, my time in Havana in 1960 when I saw people my age, I was 24 then, and I saw people my age running government ministries or directing major agencies and thinking, my God, you know, why do I need more sleep than they do? <laughs> and why can't I use my brain as much as they're using their brains? I mean, these were my thoughts at the time. And uh, that young people can do things if they're given the, uh, the ability. You know, these people were guerrilla fighters and they had great responsibility as warriors and now they, peacetime had come and they had other responsibilities and they assumed them as they had the task of guerrilla war. And some of them were actually pretty good at it. And they were also doing good things. I mean, Cuba carried out a major redistribution of national wealth. Wealth was taken from the wealthy <laughs> and given to the poor via education, via health, by all kinds of public and social services. I mean, this is what the transformation meant. From a highly, highly unequal society, Cuba was being rapidly transformed into an egalitarian society. Cubans are now free to travel to the United States, albeit Americans are not free to travel to Cuba. That's one irony. Cuba freed all the political prisoners it had arrested back in 2003. And I think arguably the United States has more political prisoners in Cuba than Cuba has. I think 170 something political prisoners at Guantanamo, that's Cuban territory. So we have more political prisoners in Cuba than Cuba has. I think that's an irony that the press often doesn't think about. Um, Cuba has privatized enormous numbers of businesses over the last few years. Another one of the United States demands on Cuba, although that's not why Cuba did it. And you go to Havana today and you can see what I call cockroach capitalism everywhere. Little stores and street vendors selling every kind of crap you can imagine. Much of it coming in from Miami as baggage uh, and investments being made from Cubans in Florida in small stores and in restaurants. You know, brother investing in brother or sister uh, or uncle or whatever. Little, these little family businesses and you can buy plumbing supplies, auto parts, food, and almost anything that you want to buy is now for sale. And Cuba has privatized other um, previously state-owned enterprises in a kind of a piñata operation. So all of these things that the United States wanted Cuba to do, it has done, albeit not because the United States wanted them to do it. But we have heard nothing from Washington, not one single move to acknowledge the enormous changes that have gone on. And recently, as you all read about, Raul Castro said he was not going to serve any more terms, that he was retiring after this term. And so that the next president of Cuba will not be named, in my opinion, Castro. Uh, it will be a younger person, and it will not be one of the originals, those who fought the Revolutionary War. So again, one of the United States demands is being met, again, not because the United States demanded it. It's just the right thing to do. Cuba is thoroughly institutionalized, and it doesn't have to worry about having a charismatic leader. The era of charisma, as Raul made clear in his speech, is over. Not necessary. Those of you who studied sociology in college will remember Max Weber's famous essay on charismatic leadership, which is what Cuba had for almost 50 years with Fidel. That era is over. And now you have the era of routine, or what Weber would have called bureaucracy which meant routine government. And Cuba is institutionalized sufficiently to be able to afford that, albeit the United States hostility persists. It's war to spread democracy in Cuba, which is one of the most absurd policies that the government has undertaken. <laughs> to organize inside of Cuba, quote, dissident groups, 
and it organizes them by making them dependent on the U.S. Embassy or the U.S. interest section for payments of one sort or another, goods or services. And uh, it has created all of these dissidents. The leading dissident, of course, who wiped the others off the face of the newspaper was a woman named Yoani Sanchez. Yo, Ani. <laughs> I, Annie, little orphan Annie, um, who writes a blog that's published in the Huffington Post. How many of you have read it? Well, in Cuba, she is not known by almost, nobody knows who she is. In this country, she's known among certain liberal sectors because she appears in the Huffington Post. And in Europe, she's even better known. But essentially what Ioanni does is spread gossip. I mean, all the crap that you hear on the street, she writes into a column. Um, and the complaints are the complaints that citizens of almost any country would make about their government. This, this is no good, that's no good, they can't collect the garbage on time, all of the stuff that any, pe any person living almost anywhere would say about their government is what she puts into her blog. There is no analysis, there is no prescription of what kind of Cuba would be better, none of that. Nor, nor do any of the dissidents have any analysis of Cuba, nor do they put forth an alternative system. All they say is we want more this or more that. So the only opposition, in, meaningful opposition in Cuba is inside the Communist Party. And unfortunately for the rest of us, we don't have access to that opposition. We don't hear the debates that are going on inside the important history-making agency in Cuba. <laughs>